Welcome to the show. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Dmitry Orlov, who is a Russian-American writer who has written several books on collapse and technology. Uh, delighted to be joined by you, Mr. Orlov. If you'd like to introduce your work to the audience for anyone unfamiliar, that'd be great. Uh, well, it's, first of all, it's great to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm um, sort of a, you know, an, I, I'm no longer a neophyte because I've been doing it for a long time, but uh, it's, you know, writing about collapse is not really my profession. I had a career before that uh, in computer engineering and then in high energy and then in, in um, e-commerce and then internet security um, and media conversion, things like that. And eventually I just came, gave up on all of this corporate stuff because I, I realized that it wasn't really heading in any direction I liked, and uh, started writing on what I thought would happen to the United States based on what I observed happening to the Soviet Union and Russia in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, because I thought that the United States would pretty much collapse. I started doing that about a dozen years ago, and... Uh, uh, strangely enough, I got a pretty good reception to start with. Uh, now, uh, there are basically two types of people who, uh, who whom I encounter, ones who just basically scream and run away. Uh, I suppose they're the majority. And uh, then there's also uh, people who've been following me or people who are realizing that I've been making, making um, valid points all along. And and so I have uh, quite a bit of a following at this point, and uh, I, I write a couple of articles a month on on mostly on current events and analysis, and and that's been that's been going pretty well and keeping me busy. Uh, not so much writing, but doing the research for the writing. That's a full time job at this point, and so that's where I am today. Yeah, and obviously uh, the events of the last few months in the U.S. I think I've heard. Uh... I've heard the the idea of collapse or the idea of a, a failed state sort of enter more and more into into people's consciousness. But um, when you look at the U.S. now and uh, you know, especially the racial ethnic tensions we've seen there the last few months, uh, do, I mean, does this look to you like a like a society that's uh, in a fairly advanced stage of collapse now, or do you think that the the U.S. can the U.S. empire can sort of still on, keep on throttling for a few years to come yet? It's very hard to to predict what the timing of this would be. Uh, the as far as uh, you know, race tensions in the United States. Um, this is nothing new. Uh, the worst uh, race riot of all time happened uh, about a hundred years ago. People are forgetting that. Um, uh, entire sections of towns were completely burnt out. You know. Uh, large numbers of people made homeless, um, and that that was a very large race riot. Uh, there were there were race riots after that in in various places in Chicago and Los Angeles and elsewhere. This is more or less uh, a repetitive process. You know that right now uh, lots of people are saying that Black Lives Matter. Uh, it's a slogan, and um, if you look at history, uh, this is not. A judgment on my part. This is an observation. Black lives seem to matter every twenty or thirty years. Um, the 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 blacks in the United States are political pawns. Um, they're basically manipulated by the Democratic establishment, um, and they're periodically unleashed on the public. Um, they're they're kept at boiling point by a number of policies that destroy black families, that imprison black men, um, that uh, that basically uh, deprive uh, black kids of any meaningful education. Um, and um, all of this makes them useful as pawns. They're, they're, ba they're basically, uh, they're, they're going to start um, rebelling and looting and, and, and causing mayhem um, whenever somebody, somebody pulls the trigger within the democratic establishment. And that's what's happening this year is, uh, you know, they're, they're, the, the pawns have been deployed in order to unseat Donald Trump um, 
because the Democrats are so desperate. Um, they're incredibly desperate. They, this is their their final gasp, and, and they, uh, uh, they they have a candidate who is uh, absolutely senile, who can't string a sen- sentence together. Um, and so this is a sign of desperation. I don't think it immediately translates into the United States collapsing. I think uh, that has to do with much uh, longer term trends that have been in the works for generations and that are at this point uh, unstoppable, not that they've ever been stoppable. I've never claimed that they were, but um, at this point, uh, most thoughtful commentators and analysts would say that these processes will simply run their course. And would you say it's uh, the source of, of collapse is, is primarily financial? Well, you, you know, I, I wrote about this quite a bit. I, I, I wrote a book, The Five Stages of Collapse, where I um, teased collapse as a process into uh, stages, um, financial, commercial, political, social, and cultural, uh, showing examples of societies, doing case studies of societies that uh, pass through or uh, were able to arrest collapse at, at each one of these stages. And the sequence makes sense because the finance basically has to do with promises people to make to each other. These promises have to be backed up by, uh, by, by, by some um, realistic notion of, uh, of what can be achieved in terms of, for instance, debt repayment. And and then uh, the function of finance is to finance productive activity. And if finance decides that uh, there is no financing uh, because the debts would not be repaid, then um, that curtails commercial activity. Factories don't get built, products don't get shipped, etc., uh, which causes the economy, physical economy of goods and services, to shrink, um, causing tax revenues to plummet. And that that hamstrings governments, which can no longer spend uh, the way they, they they are accustomed to spending, and and that leads to political paralysis and collapse. And once the political realm dissolves, then social institutions are um, you know they they come on, under uh, stress and and often fail uh, because at that point the government can't provide for the people. So it's a question of charity. Group groups and things like that, organizations, they're not up to the task usually, and those crumble. And then the final bastion is is the family, um, and um, uh, often that fails as well because of again because of stress, families dissolve and and uh, culture crumbles. Um, so that you know the final stage of cultural collapse is where people stop looking stop resembling people, stop acting like people, they, they become more like animals. Um, and that's that's the final stage of collapse after which you don't really have anything you could call humanity anymore. You just basically have these semi, semi-feral humans running around. Um, and I've even done case studies of that one case study of a society that reached that point where um, uh, uh, esteemed um, scholars uh, uh, anthropologists, one anthropologist in particular, um, decided that such societies should be completely disbanded. The, 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 the individuals have no business being together. Um, they have to be broken apart, split apart, because at that point, what culture remains is is is, uh, is pathological. Um, now, the United States, it turns out, is following this collapse sequence backwards, and this is a, a realization that I had quite recently. Because it started with uh, cultural collapse, um, basically uh, the process that's been unfolding in the United States uh, since uh, late 50s and, and throughout the 60s has uh, dismembered extended families uh, and then uh, uh, later on destroyed um, uh, nuclear families as well so that out of wedlock births are, are now quite dominant and the number of uh, Children, especially in in black families who grow up fatherless, is is staggeringly huge, um, and that that basically it indicates that so, so, that that the culture has failed. There's no longer 
real human culture. There's just commercial culture of consumerism. There's consumers that pay attention to prosumers and influencers and and uh, and media, and and in they dis the only function they they have is deciding what to consume until the money runs out. At the at which at which point they're just basically cut it completely cut loose, cut adrift. Um, society, you know, doesn't really have any um, any viable functions anymore. Uh, you know, in some places the church is still dominant and 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 the place plays a, a, a large role, but that that is really the only strong social function that exists. Um, government, we, we we can see huge dysfunction in 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 the political sphere. Basically, the, you know, they are, the the entire country is splitting up into red and and blue zones, which are more or less you know at war with each other already. Although it's not a shooting war in a lot of places yet, but it could very well evolve into one. Commerce um, um, has devolved to a point where um, the United States is not self-sufficient in, in most manufactured products, and uh, most of what it produces is ephemera, like software and and media, um, and uh, maybe some pharmaceuticals that are incredibly overpriced, um, and and a lot of agricultural products. So it's basically like a plantation economy as far as the world is concerned. It it no longer has a, a, a viable industrial sector, and then financially, it's basically a black hole because what what it does is it prints money, it lends it out to mostly to insiders. Uh, there's no expectation that these debts that are generated will ever be repaid, and eventually, these uh, these debts are converted into weird zombie financial instruments that sit on the books of we weird zombie companies uh, that are forever um, sort of kept out of bankruptcy by printing money again and lending it out. So uh, there's no pretension anymore that finan finance has anything to do with actually estimating risk and deciding when to lend based on the projected ability to repay because it's not expected that anybody at any level will ever repay anything. So it's just uh, the printing press running loose. And uh, the entire economy of the United States depend, now depends on that printing press. The moment um, it turns out that printing one more dollar doesn't produce any value at all, but actually produces negative value to the economy, it's pretty much over. Um, you know, the whole game is over. Um, when that'll happen is uh, very difficult to time, but it's it's one of those, it, it's going to be an event. It's not going to be a process. One day people will wake up and realize that uh, the Federal Reserve printing another hundred trillion dollars is not going to move the economy forward one inch. And it is at that point that it, the whole thing will be declared over. So that's that's what I'm seeing happening now. Uh, that, uh, that's interesting that you think the you know the, the final stage has sort of already happened because it would suggest I mean you've observed the the collapse of of the Soviet Union, but it seems like uh, as bad as that was at least there was you know there was still a, a family unit underneath uh, there was a you know there was a homogenous society and so it didn't take a lot to transition into a you know a kind of coherent Russian state. But then, if you if you look at the U.S. and the fact that there is that cultural collapse and uh, you know all of these tensions among classes, among races, uh, very multi ethnic society, I guess the question is, then if if the U.S. is faced with with that kind of collapse, is there any reason to believe that the the United States as as an entity would would even survive that in terms of its territorial integrity? In other words, would you be looking at sort of balkanization and you know, the collapse of, of the U.S. as a country? Well, um, there is no reason to believe that the United States uh, will uh, continue to exist once the states are no longer united. And uh, given the politics of, of today, again, the separation into uh, the, the red and blue zones, which are hostile to each other on every level, 
it's really hard to say that the, the United States are united. Again, they're united by the Federal Reserve's printing press and the U.S. dollar. Once that fails, there's nothing to hold the states together. And there's nothing to hold each individual state together. There's no reason to continue having this system, which basically redistributes printed money, printed basically out of nothing. And, and so there is, there is no reason to, to think that, you know, this political entity will abide. Now, on the ethnic level, uh, it, there's, there's still large areas, uh, mostly rural at this point, um, where the, the, the older sort of stratum of, of Anglo-German society uh, holds together. And uh, so it, it may be that there's a, there, there are large swaths of land um, patrolled by heavily armed locals uh, that are still relatively safe and relatively productive. Uh, the question is, will they be able to actually survive without access to the coasts and to the ports because the United States no longer produces the spare parts it needs to, to, to keep plant and equipment running. All of that stuff is imported now, mostly from China. And, and so, um, and there's no reason to expect that the United States will, will be able to reindustrialize under, under these conditions because the, the, the core competencies needed to reindustrialize, which the engineers, no longer exist. They all went into law and finance a long time ago and other uh, professions that basically have to do with people swindling each other. Um, so there's no reason to expect that sort of a rebirth. As far as the cities, um, um, it's really unclear what function they serve. Uh, the coronavirus shutdowns have proven that, uh, you know, cities at this point don't serve any vital function at all. They could just be disbanded. They, they could be abandoned. And, um, so it's really hard to see what, what, uh, what new cohesive thing could emerge from this process. Uh, another question that's raised then in, in the wake of a potential collapse of the U.S. is, you know, the, the U.S. is a global hegemon at present. Um, so I, I guess the question is, you know, it, it would be the end of this order that we've had since the end of the Second World War, really. So the question is, what, what springs up in that vacuum of power? Could, do you envision a kind of multipolar world uh, sort of lacking one hegemon, or do you think that China or Russia or China and Russia combined will just immediately fill that vacuum? I don't think Russia and China uh, are particularly interested in, in, in that. Um, the, the mode in which Russia operates is uh, building regional organizations uh, with uh, its Eurasian partners. Uh, and it's not so, so much multilateralism as bilateralism. Uh, they're they're basically one-to-one -one deals with various countries. There are also frameworks, which take take time uh, to to take hold. Uh, there's a strong relationship with with China, with Russia and China are definitely a unit. But I don't think anybody wants to step in and do what uh, the United States has, has been pretending to be doing, which is, um, in effect, you know, bankrupting itself by ineffectual military spending. Um, the fact that the United States uh, has troops stationed all over the place and the fact that it spends everyone in dollar terms, on yeah, that's, that's neither here nor there. It just doesn't mean anything because uh, it, it's not really capable of it anymore. I mean, look what happened when the Iranians uh, responded to, to the murder of one of their generals um, by the Americans by just blasting rockets at uh, a couple of uh, military bases, American military bases in Iraq. Well, nothing. There was no response. The, the Americans just took it. And, and so that's been um, kind of the, the, the pattern already for, that's been established for a long time. The Americans, you know, they, they, they get into harm's way, but then uh, they, they don't do anything. They, they, they haven't had a military success pretty much forever. Um, and, and so um, 
the the entire military establishment in the U.S. is basically a, a basically a money sponge. You know, it's uh, it's it's very expensive, but it's not very good. Their planes don't fly very well, and there are a lot of there are a lot of issues with just about every part of it because uh, the uh, the objective is not to defend the na nation because nobody's attacking the nation. The objective is to uh, basically absorb and distribute uh, amongst a small group of insiders as much money as possible. So if you look at defense spending parity between, say, Russia and the United States, Russia gets uh, 10 times more for um, each dollar spent than the United States. So the, the Russian military has been growing stronger and Russia has been cutting its defense spending the entire time while the United States is growing weaker uh, and keeps increasing its military spending. You know, that, that's, that those trends are unmistakable. So the idea that the U.S. is still a global hegemon based on its, uh, uh, its military prowess, uh, I think that's entirely misguided. I think the, the, the only thing that keeps the United States in the news around the world at this point is the Federal Reserve printing press and the U.S. dollar. That's it. Nothing else. Now, there was, a, there was another story leaked yesterday uh, of supposed Russian interference. This time it was in the U.K. where the, the U.K. Foreign Secretary said that the U.K. has strong reason to believe that uh, Russia leaked documents uh, in the run-up to the, the last election to try and help the Labour Party. But I'm just curious, um, because this, uh, you know, this Russiagate thing is is just, it's becoming a trope now. It's used again and again for anything the establishment as opposed to in the West. Uh, you know, even, even Tulsi Gabbard was accused of being a, a Russia agent. It's just thrown around now. It means nothing. But I'm curious what the, I'm curious what the perception is, uh, in Russia, of all the hostility that's that's suddenly directed uh, to them from from the West, um, and just more generally, I guess the the perception uh, uh, by Russians of of the liberal West and uh, many of the the problems that we're facing in the West now. Well, um, on the one hand, the, the the news coverage that one sees, which is very moderate, um, the news coverage in Russia of the West, of what's going on in the UK and in the United States. It's, it's factual, it's, it's moderate, uh, it, it's not tendentious um, as, far as, as far as my appraisal of it, uh, but uh, it's, it's ghastly. I mean, Russians look at this and think, oh my God, why did we ever think that these people were worth paying attention to? Why did we ever think that they, you know, matter? Um, so there's that understanding. As far as accusations uh, randomly lobbed in the general direction of Russia for this and that, uh, there was a, most people in Russia know what highly likely now means in English. Uh, people throw, throw that around. Um, uh, the word fake has penetrated the Russian language. Uh, specifically in reference to most things coming from the West. Um, fake news is thrown thrown around a lot. Uh, and in general, it's it's sort of like um, uh, comedy hour material at this point. There's nothing serious about it. Um, you know, the, it, it, it sort of, uh, it, 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 it's even difficult to continue the conversation about it here because people are just so sick of it. It's like, oh yeah, fake news, highly likely, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and uh, below that, uh, if you scratch the surface, the Russians are convinced that truth is on their side and truth makes them invincible. They're abs absolutely convinced of that. The other side is just lying, so it doesn't matter what they say. We know they're lying. They're liars. You know, if they're not lying, then the question becomes, when did they stop lying and why? You know, what, what caused that uh, conversion on the way to Damascus, that epiphany? Because we didn't notice one. That's quite interesting. Um, you've also written a book <clears throat> called "Shrinking the the Technosphere," which is uh, quite interesting. It builds on a lot of ideas of of uh, of Jacques Ellul, uh, sort of similar ana analysis of of technology as this uh, sort of demiurge uh, force of control. Uh, I think the way you describe it is as an emergent force. 
Um, I'm I'm kind of curious. Um, I've seen Russia itself is is investing a lot of resources into uh, crypto technology and into uh, being prepared for uh, the world moving more towards uh, crypto from fiat currency. Uh, I'm just curious how uh, how much you think that could uh, change paradigms in terms of again talking about like a a more multipolar world. Um, you know, a more a more decentralized system, uh, more anonymity, uh, more difficult for uh, central governments to uh, trace financial transactions and uh, control people by financial means. Uh, just how how significant do you think the innovations in in crypto will be? Um, crypto is is just basically a bit of software. Uh, Bitcoin is uh, phenomenally idiotic because it's a, a, a horrendous waste of energy. Uh, it, it is just the stupidest invention in the world based on its energy requirements. Um, uh, the, the anonymity it grants is uh, mostly used for all kinds of parasitism um, and, and swindles and uh, th- theft of various kinds, extortion schemes. There's nothing good about that, but uh, you know, blockchain is just a it's, it's just an algorithm. It has applications in some in some areas. It has rather good applications in some areas, such as finance, perhaps not. Now, as far as uh, what what is going on in Russia, uh, is um, a lot of effort is being expended in in streamlining uh, electronic uh, internet systems. Uh, to eliminate bureaucracy. So uh, uh, the traditionally Russia has been very kind of paper heavy, lots of lots of uh, um, pieces of paper with stamps and and signatures needed for every last thing. That's being done away with um, in in a, in a great hurry. So now it's possible to pretty much carry out any sort of uh, project with uh, basically just a um, uh, a cell phone or, or, or an iPad, something like that. Um, and uh, uh, everything is becoming um, shifting to a model where it's all done via websites and, and internet servers. Uh, so that's a very positive development. Um, Russia just uh, changed its uh, tax policy such that it has uh, perhaps the um, the most forgiving tax regime for IT companies anywhere in the world. And given the fact that it already has uh, a lot of the best talent in IT, um, it's probably going to become uh, a major uh, hub for uh, for um, software development, international software development. Uh, it'll probably um, uh, take away some of the thunder from places like Ireland that have been in the lead in this category. Um, and so that that's a positive development for Russia. And just as that ties into your work on Collapse, I mean, the, you know, the reliance that we have on, on technological systems for so much now, uh, does that add to, is that kind of a, a compounded factor in, in how devastating the collapse of a modern society would be now? that if you you know if you uh, if these technological systems start to go down uh, that it, it would have a, a compound effect in terms of the the effects of collapse well yes uh, the uh, elimination of fallback strategies is um, is generally uh, a very dangerous very dangerous thing so um, if you look at Russia for instance and uh, Russia's decision to go all in on on these uh, modernized uh, infrastructure systems, uh, it starts with um, base technologies such as uh, oil, gas, uh, coal, and and nuclear, which generate the energy, uh, the mining and manufacturing processes that provide for for uh, self sufficiency in all in all of the critical pieces of infrastructure, either directly or uh, through trusted partners such as China. And um, and it goes from there. They they build they build up an electric grid where which is self sufficient and uses parts manufactured within Russia. Uh, they they're starting to um, uh, move in the direction of um, 
providing the, their own operating systems. There, there's uh, one for that, that that is an Android replacement, Linux-based Android replacement, for instance, that's been in the works. Um, they may share that project or in the process of sharing that project with China because of all the madness around Huawei sanctions. Um, so that's built built from the ground up. Now, uh, if you look at the United States, um, the United States produced a lot of relatively low-grade, useless light oil through fracking, but that is fa has fallen apart. Nobody's financing all of that anymore, and it's, it's uh, an overall waste of money and resources. There aren't really any, uh, any fallbacks, and then there's the environmentalist lobby, which is eliminating pipelines and, and, and shutting down financing for energy projects unless there are these quote-unquote green projects that use wind and solar. And the problem with wind and solar is that it's, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the energy production from them is ragged. It's unpredictable. It has nothing to do with demand. It has to do with the supply of wind and sunlight. And there is no storage mechanism for storing large amounts of electricity that is anywhere near affordable or that can be built up in in within the required time frame so green technologies are a dead an evolutionary dead end um at least at that scale and so there is no plan so for now everybody's running around depending on the internet being available all the time but the foundation of it is the electric grid which hasn't been upgraded in a long time in the united states and um, it, it depends on a large number of nuclear power plants, about 100 of them, that are quickly aging out. The competence or the desire to build new ones is missing. And the United States lacks the capacity to, to or the ability to enrich uranium. They, they've relegated that to the Europeans, to the French, uh, Areva, and, and to Russia. So, 25% of the, the, the light bulbs that are lit up in the United States historically has been thanks to uh, MOX fuel, nuclear fuel, uh, shipped to the United States from Russia. Um, so if you look at all those dependencies and what that means, well, yes, that's incredibly precarious. And that sort of technology dependence uh, is, is really bad for a nation that could, at best, moving forward, be you know, a heavily armed agrarian nation of, of little agrarian fiefdoms. Um, and so that's not a positive moving forward. Um, you, you have written on, on peak oil as well. There was obviously a, a, a making the news a lot recently was uh, the Michael Moore documentary, Planet of the Humans, that kind of put this issue into, into people's consciousness about the uh, the lack of effectiveness of, of green technologies that we've put all our faith in. Um, and you've kind of spoken to that there. Uh, but, I mean, I guess the, the question is, you know, what, what is the alternative then? If, if, if we are reaching peak oil and our energy requirements can't be met, is it, will it just be necessary for a, a, a scale and back of, of our consumption? Or, uh, you know, you mentioned nuclear power. Is nuclear power a potential solution in the long run? Or have we kind of missed the boat on that one? Well, um, the only two countries that uh, have the capacity to, to develop nuclear at anything like uh, the, the speed needed are Russia and, and China. And uh, the only country that actually has a shot at making nuclear energy generation safe in the long run is Russia because it's pretty far along working on the closed nuclear cycle, which will not produce high level nuclear waste. It'll burn all of it, all of it up. Um, everybody else has given up on that strategy. Russia is the only one. And, and so the others will at best have to wait their turn because the way Russia deals with uh, uh, nuclear installations around the world is it basically builds the nuclear power plant. It trains locals to operate it. It, uh, it signs contracts for all of the nuclear fuel for the entire life uh, of the nuclear power plant or installation, which at this point could be over 100 years because they've, they've learned to recycle nuclear installations. Um, 
and and uh, so not every country in the world certainly not anywhere in Europe or the in the United in the United States is willing to go along with with that that deal um, other countries such as you know Turkey for instance or or Iran or or Egypt are more than happy to enter into into such a long-term agreement but basically what what that means is uh, there's an umbilical cord from from your country to Russia uh, forever and um, so countries that cultivate an adversarial stance towards Russia do not stand a chance of of getting such a contract signed at least in the first for the for the for, for the foreseeable future that's quite interesting I mean would you say that in this in the coming century i mean when you think about some some of these things like uh you know the collapse of the us as a hegemon and uh the kind of regionalism that russia is cultivating i mean are we looking at the end of of globalization as a process the end of globalism in this century well i think so i think what we're seeing is the the last dying echo of western colonialism uh, because that that's really the model that's been driving the whole thing, and uh, it's the the last dying gasp of the plantation economy, where you have uh, um, old money hiring uh, completely blockheaded, interchangeable MBAs to uh, manage projects around the world. It doesn't matter where in the world they are, and uh, paying military types to uh, basically keep keep tabs on on the local politicians to make sure that they don't get get too uppity and try to grab too much power for themselves and uh, that's going to die and and um, you know it's been dying for a long time it's been dying back this this last surge of uh, globalization w- which shipped factories uh, to uh, from from the west to other places in the world were, which had cheap energy uh, and um, and labor and uh, low regulatory costs, that has run its course. Um, and um, so I think what the future holds is, um, you know, different countries going in different directions, some developing and others undeveloping. And some rem- remaining pretty much as they are. So I, I don't, I don't expect any of this to very dramatically affect what's going to happen in, in rural Cambodia or Laos, for instance. Um, but other countries, Canada, for instance, uh, might be very dramatically affected. It depends on where in the world they are, but there, there there's no, there's no globe. It only looks like looks that way from. From from outer space, from 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 Earth orbit, um, but um, from from the ground on the ground, it doesn't look like a globe. It looks like a patch of ground that is visible from you, encompassed by the horizon, which is about fifteen nautical miles. And you know, if uh, you know, for someone listening to this, that uh, that shares your your pessimism in, in terms of where the West is going. Uh, I guess the question is, what what should someone that acknowledges that reality be doing in terms of, uh, you know, is there a way to prepare best for what's coming? Is there a way, is there a best way to kind of uh, wean yourself off the elements of the system that will, that will probably uh, suffer the worst fate? Well, um, people get by pretty well, provided they can make themselves useful to each other. Not within some uh, scheme where you go and go on some job board and and look for an employer, because those will be pretty thin on the ground, I expect. But what you can do yourself for your immediate neighbors, for people you can you can make contact with, um, and a lot of those skills are pretty basic. So, um, um, if, if in 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 the more promising places in the world, promising from the point of view of uh, surviving what's coming, people cultivate these habits. So, for instance, there's there's no conceivable reason that in Russia right now I should be growing potatoes. 
right? Except I am, <laughs> and so are most other people. It's it's sort of it's one of those things that you never want to stop being able to do. Like there's no question that you will abandon your ability to grow potatoes, even though I, I could drive to the supermarket and buy all the potatoes I could ever want and more um, for not very much money. It's not about that. Similarly, similarly, people know how to build log cabins. People know how to how to put put stoves together out of brick. You know, they there's a there's a myriad things like that 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 people know how to do. Um, they 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 will uh, they will keep old cars running because they they can be repaired using hand tools without hooking them up to a computer. Um, there are lots and lots of adaptations like that that people around the world cultivate in order to prepare for hard times because they know from their experience that the hard times are coming. They know that. It's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. Nobody knows when, and so the time to practice is now. Now, there, there are people in the West who think that, you know, basically the, the gravy train they've been on will, will, will go on forever, and that's not the fact. That's not true. So um, there are a lot of humble occupations that people could um, start learning for, start studying for, in order to make themselves useful when the time comes. Now, what tends to happen, uh, people's beliefs in a time of collapse? Because uh, I remember reading John Michael Greer predicting that uh, the baby boomers in the US would, would start uh, starting um, like suicide cults at the at the uh, at the late stage of collapse, and definitely some of the some of the social movements we're seeing in the West today, BLM, seem to resemble uh, religious cults in, in their orientation. Uh, but you know, I'm curious for for a society that's really bought into the religion of progress and faith and optimism. What what starts to happen that when when things turn sour? Um, will we see a, a new religiousness, and and if so, what what would that look like? In some places, there will be new religiousness. Uh, uh, the uh, different populations are more or less susceptible to to uh, to entering into cults. There was a um, a lot of penetration of various cults into Russia around the the time of the Soviet collapse in the nineties. And um, uh, there was um, uh, quite a period of time when the, the authorities had to rush around and put out these fires um, um, and eliminate um, some of the nastier cults. Some of them are still around. Uh, it's, it's a nasty problem to have to deal with. And, and so, yes, uh, hopelessness breeds that sort of uh, wishful thinking and, and people who show up and and sell you some sort of a dream, no matter how preposterous, uh, fill that vacuum of hope. So we, we can expect plenty of that. But Russia itself seems to have, it seems to have rebounded uh, fairly well and, and quite rapidly after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean, the it's quite something to see the the level of, of religiousness, like how, how quickly it turned from a, an atheistic society to really one of the only traditional Christian societies in, in the world. Um, do you think, in, in terms of, again, just looking at, at the West trajectory, uh, I mean, is, it, is it inevitable that there would be a, a return to traditional society? In other words, when, when you lose the, the power of the centralized state, uh, is it a necessary process that more org organic orders like uh, religiosity and ethnic communities uh, spring up in that vacuum? I wouldn't uh, exaggerate uh, that because, um, you know, there are things that only work in Russia. Russian things tend to only work in Russia. Chinese things tend to only work in China. And it's useless to try to copy them because, uh, for instance, the incredible wealth of, uh, of Orthodox Christian tradition that Russia never lost is what provided for this revival. It's not something that was done from scratch. It, it, it basically had to do with 
uh, a living tradition that was never extinguished coming into its own again. Um, and therefore it happened more or less automatically and, uh, and uh, perhaps even effortlessly. Uh, I wouldn't say that anything like that could possibly happen in, in any of the Catholic countries or any of the Protest Protestant countries. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's, not, it's not something organic. Uh, to to those countries. And just a, a, another question uh, related to kind of what what comes after all of this, what comes after progress. In terms of um, population growth, we're on a fairly steep curve. I mean, I think the, the projection for uh, the end of the century is something like 11 billion. Um, without peak oil and without the you know, without the huge surplus of energy we've been given. I mean, I think 97% of, of, uh, of agriculture production in the U.S. is, is from fossil fuels. Uh, would we be expecting a, a sharp decrease in that? I mean, there's presumably if there was a, a collapse of, of industrial civilization, I mean, there's a huge uh, surplus population of, of young people grown in Africa. I think Nigeria's population is uh, scheduled to... Uh, outpaced the, the US by, by the middle of this century. W would we potentially be looking at, at near devastating effects in terms of uh, famine, in terms of population die-offs? Well, I, I think there'll be die-offs. I think uh, for long periods of time in various parts of the world, the death rate will exceed the birth rate, which is all it takes. You know, that that's uh, another exponential that uh, that that uh, societies tend to follow. Uh, they, they expand exponentially, then they contract exponentially. Um, in terms of looking at overpopulation overall, uh, how is Nigeria relevant to Russia or Canada? Is it at all? Are Russia and Canada overpopulated? Are they in any danger of being overpopulated? Uh, as far as hunger, is there enough land if tilled by hand to feed let's say 10 times the russian population well yes there's a where i'm sitting right now well you know there, i have i have my field the neighbors have their fields and around that we have tall grass that nobody even cuts for hay <clears throat> because there isn't really the need it's fallow so if uh if this village where, where I am expanded by a factor of 10, we'd still have a lot of fallow land. And that's not even touching the forest, which is huge. So I don't, I don't think Russia has an overpopulation problem. Russia has an underpopulation problem. Uh, now, uh, you could make the point that, well, okay, Russia, but then what about, uh, what about Bangladesh? Bangladesh has... Uh, uh, same population as the entire Russian Federation, and it, it is um, smaller than um, one of the smaller Russian regions, uh, of which there are something over 70. So um, what about Bangladesh? And the answer is, well, Bangladesh isn't Russia, is it? So what's the topic of conversation? Uh, it's pointless to talk about global po population. Absolutely pointless, because Again, you're, you're considering a, a, a fictional entity called the globe, whereas where, where you're sitting, you can observe a tiny fraction of it, and uh, you will never meet any of those people. You will probably never travel outside of a few countries that are safe to visit. So it's pointless to talk about. Right, and in terms of... Um... You know, I guess this is where the the global element comes into it in terms of uh, discourse, especially in recent years. In terms of, you know, a lot of people talk about and often tie this into collapse, uh, a global sort of ecological collapse and tie it into global warming or potentially that will will reach a precipice and potentially the destroy the Anthropocene. So obviously you don't take those kinds of projections very seriously, do you? Well, those projections are based on models that uh, the more I've looked into it, the more I became convinced that it's, it's all just, uh, uh, to put a fine point on it, bullshit. Uh, it's political bullshit. 
Uh, there's no real credible science behind any of it. Um, it's all just a, an effort to eke out some kind of economic advantage. That's quite interesting. Um, and uh, is that is that a, a popular belief uh, in in Russia? Or is is that still quite a distant belief there as well? Well, in Russia, there isn't any mechanism of making everybody believe some outlandish thing <laughs> uh, like there is in the West. People tend to kind of like listen to you and say, oh, yeah, you, you, you sound like you're, you know what you're talking about, but do you? Um, and, and so they, they kind of look at uh, weather trends and, and listen to a lot of different scientists. Uh, Russian scientists are also an unruly bunch. There isn't this kind of like Western group think where either you believe in global warming and cataclysmic climate change or you are shit out of luck and you've just been fired. There isn't that. So, for instance, there are Russian scientists who are puzzled by the fact that the, the global ocean has been warming. Uh, it's been going on for a few decades now and it's been warming all the way through starting from the bottom, great depths. And uh, it turns out that the entire planet is warming up a little bit. Um, there's something similar to a nuclear reactor uh, that is very badly understood that's hiding uh, deep in, 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 the, in the molten mag uh, of the Earth's core. And uh, it seems to be, have, have kicked up a notch. Now it probably fluctuates, goes up and down, but that may explain a bit of the warming. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, it counteracts a tendency, which is that the, the sun is approaching a, a, a major solar minimum, which uh, would actually make the earth cooler. And um, because the ocean is warming, uh, a lot more CO2 is percolating from the ocean waters, um, you know, massively more than any industrial activity could produce. That, that is just, uh, you know, um, orders of magnitude higher. So that may have to do something with greenhouse effect uh, kicking up a little bit. But um, as far as cataclysms, I think the biggest risk we'll run is the onset of the next ice age because we're overdue for one. And there are plenty of scientists who uh, believe that. It's quite interesting. Um, we're coming up to an hour, so uh, I'll just finish with this. Uh, you know, a, a lot of work has been done in, in terms of forecasts and political trends. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Peter Turchin, but you know, he predicts that the 2020s will be the, the most polarized decade in, in a century. Um, and, you know, we, I think we, we've seen things this year that might have been unimaginable just a couple of years ago. So I'm just curious from, from your perspective, uh, looking ahead for the next decade, what do you think we should expect to see in, in the next 10 years? Will this be the, the start of, of the kind of collapse you're talking about? And what can we expect to see in terms of social and political ramifications? Well, I predicted that the United States would collapse in, in a foreseeable future. Uh, I started, uh, I, I realized that that was going to happen sometime, sometime around 1996. I kept quiet about it for um, um, quite a while. And, and, uh, and then early this century, I started thinking about publishing about it and actually started doing it. Now, 20 years into the new century, um, this notion that the United States is going to collapse is not the least bit outlandish. Uh, a lot of people are saying the same thing. Uh, so to that extent, I'm vindicated, and I expect that I will be fully vindicated, um, you know, while I'm still alive, definitely. Um, and in fact, I'm planning to move on to doing something else with my time uh, once the United States does collapse, because, you know, uh, the subject matter will be uh, effectively tapped out as far as I'm concerned. All right. Um, that's been a, a fascinating interview. If you'd just like to finish off by promoting your work where people can find your uh, website, anything like that, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yes, it's uh, the, the, the main website off of everything, uh, 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 off of which everything 
branches out is cluborlov.blogspot.com. And uh, I publish uh, for subscribers only on Subscribestar and Patreon. Um, and and uh, I publish a, a couple of uh, articles every month. Um, pretty large readership, so I welcome people to join me. All right, that's excellent, and uh, recommend your your books as well. They're uh, they're fantastic reading, and I definitely think uh, I definitely think it's a those kinds of topics are becoming increasingly relevant, and people are looking for relevant material. So uh, it was great to have you on, and again, I thank you for joining me. Thank you very much.